Thank you for joining us for EMCA's The Life and Times of Aristotle, Socrates, Onassis panel discussion. This event is in association with AHEPA's National Hellenic Cultural Commission. My name is Luke Katsos, EMCA's president and AHEPA's National Hellenic Cultural Commission chairman. Our distinguished panel today for our panel discussion includes Professor is, is, uh, Minyi Lam, the director of the Modern Greek Program in the Department of Classics as of Georgetown University, author, writer, Lou Yurinek, professor of journalism, retired at Boston University, author, poet, Nicholas Alexiou, professor of sociology and director of the Hellenic American Project at Queens College, writer, producer, actor, Anthony George Scordy, director, Dick Grant Tulane, and uh, and with us coming perhaps later is Assistant Director George Zuvalos. This year is the 100th anniversary of the burning of Smyrna and EMCA will have a few discussions during the year on it, its effects and consequences. Over the last few years, we have had yearly commemoration panel discussions in September on this horrific genocide. The burning of Smyrna in the Hellenic Katastrophiti Smyrnus refers to the deliberately set fire four days after the Turkish forces entered and captured the port city of cosmopolitan Smyrna in Asia Minor, and, it, and which completely destroyed its Hellenic and Armenian quarters. The fire was started on September 13th and extinguished September 22nd in 1922. Turkish troops for eyewitnesses systematically cordoned off the quay to contain the Hellenes and Armenians within their fire zone quarters and prevented them from fleeing. The estimated Hellenic and Armenian deaths resulting from the fire ranged up to 100,000. Approximately up to 400,000 Hellenic and Armenian refugees were in the city from other parts of Asia Minor to escape the Turkish forces and irregulars and crammed its waterfront and quays to escape from the horrific flames. Eyewitness reports describe panic-stricken civilian refugees diving into the water to escape the flames and that their terrified screaming could be heard miles away. The Onassis story, one of the tens of thousands stories of survivors of the Smyrna genocide is the story that has to be told. In his case, Onassis, a product of the Smyrna catastrophe became one of the most famous, richest and most fascinating charismatic men in the 20th century. Born in Smyrna, Aristotle Socrates Onassis, in uh, January of, uh, of 1906, fled the city uh, with his family to Greece in 1922 in the wake of that burning and of the last phase of the 30 year genocide, 1894 to 1924, Hellenic Christian genocide that took approximately 1.5 million Armenians, 950,000 Hellenes, and 750,000 Assyrian lives. He never forgot this period. He lost three uncles, an aunt and her husband and their daughter who were burned to death in a church in Theatira where 500 Christians were seeking shelter during the Smyrna burning. With the Onassis family's substantial Asia Minor property holdings lost, he and his family became refugees and Aristotle hell bent to succeed. He arrived from Greece where he and his family were refugees at, eight, at age 17 in 1923 to Buenos Aires, Argentina. He arrived on the Nansen passport, originally an officially stateless person's passports from 1922 to 1938, virtually penniless. Actually he had uh, 250, approximately $250. The rest is history and a history both of the burning of Smyrna, as well as the life and times of Aristotle Onassis, uh, this discussion will explore. We will also explore the new off-Broadway play Onassis and his life written, produced, and acted by Anthony George Scorthy. The play will open March the 3rd and runs, runs through March 20th at the American Theater of Actors in Manhattan. On March 15th, on the anniversary of Onassis passing, actor Anthony Scordy with his uh, production crew and EMCA in association with AHEPA, 
uh, Delph uh, and the help of Delphi chapter 25 and Hermes chap chapter 186 will host an Onassis play special charity fundraising benefit event. All the ticket proceeds that evening of this special uh, benefit performance will be going 50-50, 50% -50, uh, 50 to the uh, Greek division of the Ronald McDonald House, which provides support services for families from Greece and Cyprus, as well as for the Greek Americans staying in New York City while bat battling cancer, and 50% to the Hellenic American Project at Queens College, a nonprofit program that documents the Hellenic American presence in the United States from the first wave of mass immigration in the 19, early 1900s to the present and operating as a research facility, archive, Greek uh, American library and museum. Uh, we're gonna start uh, this panel discussion with a few presentations from our uh, panelists. Uh, we're going to start off with uh, uh, Professor Isminya Lam. Isminya Lam is the uh, director of the Modern Greek Studies program at, at Georgetown University, where she teaches all level of modern Greek language and a wide range of interdisciplinary courses on Greek culture, including courses on media, film, Byzantine history, civilization, uh, the uh, Orthodox faith and Greek business culture. She is also a, 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 a C.S. Lewis fellow. Her research interests include the influence of political ethos and media on Greek national identity and expression, modern Greek reception studies, uh, national and ecumenical Hellenism and social and humanitarian issues in contemporary Greece. Uh, currently, uh, she is writing a book um, on, uh, on Horton. And just a little bit about that. The, uh, uh, she has just completed, actually, the authorized... Uh, is it completed, Ismini? Yes, completed. Ah, very good. She has just completed the... Uh, beautiful, Ismini. She has just completed the, uh, the authorized biography of George Horton, the American Philhellene classicist, poet, best-selling author, diplomat, and ethnographer. The uh, biography demonstrates uh, Horton was a humanitarian who helped Muslims, Jews, and Christians alike, and a reliable witness to history whose objective reporting was applauded by senior leaders. It also reveals how key figures in the Department of State promoted disinformation, fake news, and engineered a cover-up of the Asia Minor genocides and ethnic cleansing. Professor Lamb speaks frequently on Greek culture, history, and current events. Welcome, Izmini. And thank you for being with us today. Well, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, Lou, for including me in this uh, distinguished uh, panel. Well, as Lou said, for the past eight years, I have been researching the life and times of uh, George Horton and quite a bit, of course, centered around Smyrna. So today I will speak uh, first about Onassis' time in Smyrna, then about the impact uh, this experience had on him. And lastly, uh, I will discuss Onassis' uh, Hellenic identity. Well, uh, as you heard, Smyrna was a vibrant city with a large number of Greeks. So uh, when the Turkish nationalists entered the cities and sacked it and burned it, Horton was there and so was Aristotle Onassis. In fact, Onassis' favorite uncle, Alexander, and his father, Socrates, uh, were friends uh, with uh, Horton. Well, like Horton, Onassis uh, saw Smyrna burning from the bridge of an American ship where that would eventually take him to safety. So they shared some experiences. Uh, and the first uh, what, uh, point I would like to discuss is uh, Ona what Onassis experienced in Smyrna, of course, before getting on that ship and getting to Mytilene. Well, he was very young and his age uh, is uh, disputed. Not everybody knows exactly about his age, uh, but he pretended he was 16 for a good reason. Uh, he did not want to be rounded up by the Turks uh, who were rounding up anyone between 16 or 17 and 50 to take them into the interior. They thought uh, it, it, they, they might fight uh, against the Turks, uh, but, uh, even that is not accurate because the Turks frequently took um, young men younger than 16, even as young as 13 or 14. 
Well, his father was a wealthy merchant. And uh, when he saw what was coming, uh, the disaster that was coming, he sent uh, his um, uh, he sent his daughters, uh, his wife, uh, his mother, and the young members of the family to Lesbos. But he kept uh, Ale- um, Aristotle Onassis with him to protect uh, their commercial interests in tobacco and cotton and so on. So. Uh, He was in Smyrna, Aristotle, during the catastrophe, and he experienced what so many did, including Horton, brutal destruction, atrocities, and cataclysmic horror, to use Nicholas Gage's um, apt description. Well, first, like everyone else, he experienced hardship, hurt, loss. He lost property, the money, family fortune was destroyed. His birthplace was in flames, his homeland, was lost. But worst of all, he lost family. He had three uncles. One was hung in a town 40 um, uh, miles east of Smyrna. Uh, Two others were taken uh, into the interior and they were uh, doing hard labor in camps and torture. Eventually they were able to make uh, their way out of there. And as uh, Lou mentioned, his aunt and uncle and and so on who burned um, in, uh, in, in the church. But he also experienced humiliation. When uh, the Turkish police finally came to take his father to jail, Onassis was left alone in his family home. And a Turkish general eventually commandeered uh, his family home. uh, And he uh, really was reduced to being a supplicant, if you will, kowtowing to the general and his surgeon uh, who uh, in return for the help uh, uh, Onassis provided uh, would um, uh, help him and, and do um, favors for him. Uh, Onassis had promised to get them whiskey and cigars and take care of the house and all that. He used his spirit of cunning, if you will, to, to talk his way out of a difficult situation. Well, Many of you probably know that the Turks particularly enjoyed humiliating Greeks. For example, before getting on the ships, they were on the care, the fire behind them. They were trying to get on the ships to escape. Each person had to go through no less than five Turkish checkpoints where they were bodily searched, each time taking away whatever valuables uh, that might have been left. And on occasion, they would take a young boy Uh, saying arbitrarily, well, this boy looks 14, 15, 16 to me, we'll take you into the interior. But what most of all Onassis experienced was the horror. And I will certainly not talk about the atrocities and horrific, indeed sadistic behavior of the Turks, because we have with us the undisputed expert on Smyrna, Lou Urenek. I will say, however, Uh, what Horton said. At Smyrna, nothing was lacking in the way of atrocity, lust, cruelty, and all that fury of human passion, which given their full play, degrade the human race to a level lower than the vilest and cruelest of beasts. I want to share with you now how Aristotle Onassis escaped from Smyrna. Often in times of crisis, we're forced to choose whether we're going to be the good Samaritans or look the other way. Well, when George Horton was forced by his nemesis, uh, Admiral Bristol, the high commissioner of the United States in Constantinople in Turkey, he was forced to leave Smyrna. He left behind in charge of the consulate affairs two vice consuls, uh, Barnes and um, Park. Well, Park uh, was uh, the one who helped Aristotle Onassis escape. Uh, The two uh, consuls actually were a study in contrast. And uh, while um, uh, Barnes uh, sided with Bristol's uh, mentality, shall we say, and prejudice and all that, he would turn Um, He would turn Greeks over to the Turks. He would ignore their plight by contrast. Uh, Park chose to help them and he helped Onassis. 
And how it happened is when Onassis, he finally uh, saw what was coming, he went to the Majestic Hotel where they had set up the temporary U.S. consulate because the actual building was uh, burned. Um, and um, uh, uh, Park hid Onassis in his roll top desk. So when the uh, Turkish police went looking for him, uh, he would say, well, he's not here. And as soon as uh, they left, he dressed um, Aristotle in a sailor's uh, outfit and was able to get him on the USS uh, Etzel, the a destroyer. And eventually, of course, he went to, uh, to freedom, to Mytilini. Well, um, and um, the second thing that I would like to discuss is what impact did this cataclysmic uh, horror have on Onassis? As I mentioned, uh, times of crisis bring out either the best or the worst in people. Well, Onassis chose the former and rose to the challenge and demonstrated characteristics that served him well later. He saved his father, and himself in a very courageous and shrewd uh, way. He managed to get a, a passport to a pass that allowed him to wander wherever he wanted in, a, in the chaotic uh, uh, city of Smyrna at the time. And he was able to go to jail and uh, smuggle money to his father so he could have better food and better treatment. Well, at some point he was caught and that's how he ended up uh, uh, to the, at the Majestic Hotel and was helped by Vice Consul Park. Another thing that uh, stands out about Onassis is that he put people before money. He saved his father by actually giving up a good part of the fortune they were able to salvage during these uh, chaotic times. And later on, we hear uh, stories about uh, how considerate he was to his guests. For example, Churchill, who was a frequent guest on his yacht Onassi, had trouble sleeping. And Onassis would ask his captain at night to slow the engines down. They would be more quiet so Churchill could get some rest. And also they talked about his relationship with his servants. He was courteous and humane, unlike to unlike his nemesis, uh, Niarchos. I think Onassis also learned how to be thankful. An example is when they finally, the, fa the surviving family members made it uh, to Greece, they were having a celebration, but his ar sister Artemis was lamenting their losses and was crying. So Aristotle said, stop crying. Others left their carcasses in Asia Minor while we saved ourselves. And of course, he was fearless. As one source note, since the time he saw Smyrna in flames, Onassis never feared anything again in his life. He became the multi-billionaire who never employed bodyguards. And of course, he was a risk taker. Many people wonder what is the secret of Onassis' success, his financial success in particular. Well, first and foremost, is taking monumental risks. He himself said, my whole life has been a terrific gamble. It certainly shaped his attitudes towards life. He said, unless you know my history, you'll never understand what makes me the man I am today. And lastly, he never forgot Smyrna. He actually helped to um, rebuild uh, Nea Smyrna, the new Smyrna section uh, in the south of um, Athens, outside, just outside of Athens. And he was um, a significant donor for the Estia of Nea Smyrna, a foundation uh, supported by him and other uh, refugees to promote, serve, and share the cultural heritage of Smyrna. And something else interesting, on his island in Scorpios, he tried to recreate his Smyrna home, if you will, and his culture a bit. He planted flowers and trees all over the island that originated actually from Smyrna, or reminiscent of Smyrna, including the fragrant tobacco plants. And finally, to my point, was Onassis typically Greek? 
As an Ionian Greek, was he different? Were the Ionian Greeks different from the mainland uh, Greeks, or the Greeks of the old of old Greece, as they call, call them? Well, he was different, of course. He was the richest, uh, one of the richest, if not the richest man in the world, and one of the most easily recognizable names, arguably after Zorba. <laughs> but were his personality and traits different? They were some who saw the Ionians as different than the mainland Greeks, for sure. But what is interesting is a little incident with Callas. She once uh, referred to him indirectly as Turkosporos, which means sperm of the Turk. And Onassis was really offended. He heatedly reminded her of the glorious Hellenic heritage, naming many great Ionians who hailed from that part of the world, from Homer to Herodotus, much like all mainland Greeks who, of course, tell us about their wonderful Hellenic heritage. Horton, whose wife was an Ionian Greek and was well-versed uh, in uh, Greek differences as well as similarities, he chose to stress the similarities. He once asserted, to me, there is about as much difference between an Anatolian Greek and a Hellenic Greek as there is between an Athens fly and a Smyrna fly. <laughs> and Horton thought Odysseus, Odysseus was the prototypical Greek. He said in, uh, during his 1907 tour uh, in the United States, where he gave many a speech, Odysseus, the typical Greek, had the spirit of adventure, a wanderer. He was as bold, plausible, talkative, when need be, wry, capable of extricating himself from the most perilous difficulties. He traveled far, yet he never longed, he ever longed for his native isle, to which he hoped to return at last, deeply religious, filial, and a good parent. Does he remind you of anyone? Well, Onassis was a traveler, an adventurer, bold, talkative, and as he proved in Smyrna, capable of extricating himself from the most perilous of difficulties. He might not have been the greatest parent, I do not know, but he never forgot his family. When he got to Argentina, he went into business with his cousin and his father, despite an earlier rift in their relationship. And uh, he named the first ship after his sister Caliroy, his half sister, and the two next ships after his mother Penelope and his father Socrates. Horton also talked about how successful Greeks always returned and gave back to their country. Well, Onassis certainly did that. A good example is the Onassis Foundation, which funds worldwide promotion of great culture events, scholarships, international prizes in various fields. He has indeed uh, given us uh, perhaps his greatest legacy. Smyrna was a searing, life-changing experience for Onassis, Horton, and anyone who survived it. And it certainly changed Onassis, make him better, not bitter. He did not indulge in self-pity. His longtime associate, Costas Gatsos, recalled about his son's death in an airplane accident. He did not really want to leave. He felt cheated and he blamed himself for having been cheated. He felt responsible for Alexander's death, but there was no self-pity at all. There was an extraordinary degree of stoicism in the way he took everything. By learning from, and not just lamenting Smyrna, Onassis was able to marshal the typically Greek traits that have made the Greeks resilient, resourceful, and accountable to their families, to their country, and to their faith. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ismenia, for that. And I think Onassis has uh, been quoted as saying something like, uh, there's only one rule, there are no rules. And in terms of Maria Callas and her comment, uh, Turcos Poros, uh, that, was, that was a pretty common phrase uh, with many people in the mainland, not only in Greece, but also in the United States of America, where a lot of the people who came from Asia Minor, they called them Turcos Pori. And uh, they also called them yaurto fagadas. In other words, that they were yogurt eaters. So those, those were like nasty things that 
that some of the mainland people uh, uh, spoke about when referring to the refugees, which was a very bad thing, I think, historically, uh, historically, quite frankly, among, among our people. And it's a real, it's a real problem. Uh, our next uh, panelist uh, I'd like to introduce, we have the honor of having uh, Professor Lou Uranek. Uh, he is a writer and retired professor who has written three books and now working on a fourth. He has taught in professional settings as a writing coach for media and research organization, organizations, and his work has appeared in the New York Times, the Philadelphia Inquirer, the International Herald Tribune, Boston Globe, Neiman Reports, and many others. Lou is the editor of the, uh, was the editor of the Portland Press Herald and a senior editor at the Philadelphia Inquirer. Professor Uranek uh, was a Neiman Fellow and editor in residence at Harvard University. As a Fulbright uh, senior specialist, he taught at the National University in Kiev. And, uh, you know, just a, a side comment on that. Uh, we're, we're all obviously watching what's taking place in the Ukraine right now and our, and our sympathies and uh, hopes are with, are with the people there to maintain uh, their freedom. He was the Eleftherios of Venizelos Chair in Modern Greek Studies at the uh, American College in Greece and Athens and has been inducted into the main journalism Hall of Fame. His book, Backcast, won the National Outdoor Book Award for Literary Merit in 2007. He has received the Hellenic Heritage Award and the New England Academy of Journalists named him a recipient of the Yankee Quill Award, New England's, New England's highest individual award for journalism. He has been a professor of journalism at Boston University from 2004 until recently and was the chairman of the Department of Journalism at Boston University from 2006 to 2010. Welcome you, uh, Lou, and thank you for being on the panel today. Thank you, Lou, and, and thank you, Ismini, as well, for that, that really interesting and uh, fascinating look at uh, Onassis. So uh, historians uh, uh, tell a lot of different stories about Smyrna, and very often we can learn more about the historian than we can about Smyrna from the story that they tell. <clears throat> The word that's current these days is narrative, and there are many different narratives about what happened at Smyrna. The Greeks have their narrative, the Turks have their narrative, the French, the Italians, the British, they have their own narratives. And these are all different stories that they tell. And uh, the Americans have their narrative as well. In fact, the Americans have two narratives about what happened at Smyrna uh, in stark disagreement. And uh, <clears throat> Ismini alluded to some of that in terms of the disagreement that arose in America following uh, the, uh, the burning of Smyrna. So um, what I'd like to do uh, is try to uh, situate uh, Smyrna, the, the Onassis family a little bit in, in Smyrna, tell you about Smyrna. Many of you already know about how special Smyrna was, <clears throat> but I'll say a word about that because it clearly it's uh, what, what uh, shaped the Onassis uh, family. So uh, I'm going to put a picture up uh, of uh, Onassis as a boy in uh, Smyrna. I'm going to try to do that. And uh, maybe I could use some help here. <laughs> um, is our, OK, there's Cher. And um, let's see. Can you see a picture here? Yeah. Oh, okay, good. So that's uh, Aristo, as they called him, when he was a boy in Smyrna. He's, uh, believe it or not, he's 16 years old in this picture. Um, and uh, so uh, the characteristics, well, first let me say ab about Smyrna, then move into the, the Onassis family. Smyrna was an extraordinary city. It may have been the richest city in the Eastern Mediterranean. It was rich by virtue of its export products, the agricultural products, the carpets, 95% of the carpets that came out of Asia passed through Smyrna. Uh, the the uh, trade in opium, the Onassis family was very big in the trade 
in opium. Uh, <clears throat> so it was, a, it was an entrepreneurial center uh, that produced tremendous wealth. Tobacco was another major export from Smyrna. The Onassis family obviously was very involved in the tobacco trade. In fact, it's worth noting that there probably would not have been an American cigarette industry as, as it came to be known in the 20th century if it were not for Turkish tobacco. It wasn't mm -hmm. until Turkish tobacco was combined into American tobacco that cigarette smoking became acceptable, you know, something pleasurable to, to an American audience. So there was a huge amount of American investment in, in Smyrna. And there were many, many wealthy families, Greek families, Armenian families, so-called Levantine uh, families. And uh, it was a city, city that not only accumulated huge wealth, it spent that wealth and it spent that wealth lavishly. It had a race course, it had a golf course, it had 17 movie theaters, it had cafes, it had music halls, it had an opera house, it had a yacht club. Um, and everybody in Smyrna was having a good time up until September of 1922. And uh, so it was a, it was a, a kind of uh, a city of libertines in some way, a uh, <clears throat> city of great wealth, and uh, sort of the kind of reputation that Beirut came to have in the middle of the 20th century, but even more so, much more so. And as a consequence of that entrepreneurial spirit, um, I think Smyrna continues to hold a, uh, a grip on the Greek imagination. That's another topic for another day. But it was a very lively place. We can say that. And among the, the really wealthy uh, uh, people in Smyrna was the Onassis family, a Greek family. And uh, <clears throat> the, um, the father of, of, of Aristotle was a, a very a major figure in the city. He was uh, president of the Tobacco Sellers Association. And um, he also figured very prominently into an organization called the Asia Minor Defense League. And just to do a little bit of a deep dive on that, because it became important in terms of how the Turks came to view the Onassis family. <clears throat> It was becoming clear to the, to the Greeks in Smyrna um, in 1922, before the, before the Turks entered the city, that the party was going to be over, or likely to be over. And the Greeks uh, formed themselves, formed this Asia Minor Defense Association, as first a, as a kind of a business organization and a, a way to think about the future but it also became a kind of a paramilitary nationalist organization that armed its members against the eventual uh, battle that they knew was going to come uh, with the Greeks, I mean, with the Turks. And, uh, and so the Anassas family was uh, very deeply involved in this organization. They, they probably in fact led it. So when the Turks uh, eventually came into uh, Smyrna in September of uh, 22, they went looking for the Onassis family. They knew who the members were. And uh, as Ismini pointed out, they arrested the father and, and jailed him and they took the house and, and the son sort of stayed on. Um, in fact, many of you know, his sort of crafty ways, you know, which became legendary uh, through the rest of his life, served him very well. He was able to, to get contraband and bring it to the Turks, and that allowed him to get passes to move through the city and, and, and so forth. Uh, so um, it's interesting to try to situate this family and what was happening into Smyrna at the time. Now, the father, Socrates, he was a very strict, stern, and um, religious individual. He had a strong hand in that family. He was the leader of the family and uh, kept things together, directed the business, and he had a lot of conflict with his son. And so, you know, why did he have conflict with his son? Because his, his son was a playboy, even as a teenager. Aristo was out consorting with women, 
Many of them, they were older than he was, and many of them were prostitutes. A lot of prostitutes in Smyrna in those years. The Greek administration moved them to the outer section of the city, but nonetheless, there were a lot of prostitutes in, in Smyrna. Many of them came from Eastern Europe. Some of them were, were homegrown. But in any event, uh, uh, Aristotle uh, was, uh, he was a good time Charlie, shall we say. And uh, he was partying all the time. He loved sports. He loved football, soccer. Uh, he was very athletic. He was a good swimmer. He was, he was small, but he was very muscular. Let me um, show a picture here again. Uh, is there any picture up on the screen at this point? No. Okay. Let me try to show another picture here if I can. Okay, here's Pop Socrates, and uh, here's the son. Um, and so the two of them um, had, had a lot of conflict over his lifestyle. And, um, <clears throat> uh, and which is one of the reasons why uh, Aristotle uh, uh, gravitated to the uncle. You know, the uncle was sort of his favorite male figure. As, as Meadey pointed out. He was much more of an easygoing guy, unlike the father, and, um, and sort of looked to him for direction and, and permission and so forth. So, um, you know, what, we, what you need to understand about Smyrna is that it was extremely wealthy. It was a kind of playground. The Onassis family figured very importantly into that life of business and, um, and spending and luxury and so forth. And of course, all of it came to an end, <clears throat> you know, beginning in September 14, when the city caught fire and, um, and eventually um, a bur near 90% of the city burned. It was tremendous suffering. And, and uh, there were, you know, more than a quarter of a million refugees in that city. So there were a lot of heroes uh, in the city of Smyrna uh, during that fire. Uh, the Onesis family were not among them. Uh, there were American heroes, Greek heroes, and so forth. So Aristotle escaped, uh, as Ismene described it. Uh, he left there as a, as a rich boy who, who eventually who came to have nothing, but he rebuilt that wealth. And he, in many ways, he rebuilt the life that he had been living as a young man um, in his later years, uh, living, the, living the high life that we have come to know about him. So I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop right there and, and um, <clears throat> let others uh, talk more about Onassis. Thank, thank you, Lou, for that. Thank and, you very uh, much. It's great. Some of, some of the things that you discussed were, were quite interesting. One, one related, obviously, to the, to the opium trade. Right. Because many, <laughs> many well, people- It was legal at the time. Yeah, yeah, no, I understand. Many people don't realize that that was a, a huge, a huge business. And as a matter of fact, we've had we've had some events also, obviously, on the uh, Hellenic Revolution and all the rest of that. And and the Americans themselves in, uh, you know, from the late 1700s into the 18 early 1800s were, in fact, practicing that trade, especially since you're from the uh, uh, the Massachusetts area. There were Brahmins from uh, the Boston area in particular. Who were who were trading in opium, where they would buy it, you know, for some price in uh, in Turkey, and then sell it sell it in China for four times the value. That's right. And uh, that has an interesting history, but a, but a, but a side history. The other thing is just the tobacco industry, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, trading in tobacco. Uh, many people don't realize that um, uh, also in the United States of America, a lot of early Hellenic Americans were dealing in the tobacco trade in New York, for example. Some of them formed some some large uh, tobacco companies, which were sold Good. later to, to other companies and became right. part of the conglomerates that exist in the United States. Sure. That's a fascinating history that, that I think also that, that, that we should touch on. Thank you, Lou. And uh, we'll get back obviously on the, on the panel discussion that we're gonna have after the, um, the uh, presentations. Our next, sure. uh, our next uh, uh, presenter is um, Professor uh, Nicholas Alexiou. Many of you know him obviously because we've done a lot of things together um, 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 in many cases and more recently. 
And also uh, on the Onassis play that uh, we're going to have in terms of the, um, of the benefit performance, uh, you know, Nicholas Alexiou is also the, the director of the Hellenic American Project, which I'll describe in a second. Uh, so uh, Nico, Nico Alexiou was born in Volos in Greece, uh, where he studied economics. Uh, he has received an MA degree in sociology from uh, Queens College and a PhD also from the Graduate Center at the uh, City University of New York. He has taught in the Department of Sociology at Queens College since uh, 1990 and has received the President's Award for Excellence in Teaching. His fields, uh, field of interest are social and political sociology, ethnic studies, and research. He has established the first archive library museum for the Greeks of New York, and he is the Director of Research of the Hellenic American Project, known as HAP, H-A-P, at Queens College. Also a contemporary poet, he is the author of six books of poetry, and many of his poems have been published in Greek and American journals and anthologies. He is a member of the Greek Authors Association in, uh, in Greece, obviously, and the Greek American Writers Guild of uh, Association in New York. Welcome, Nico, and, and great to have you back again. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, first of all, I want to thank you for uh, uh, doing this uh, support uh, because research, it is uh, a very collective uh, thing and it needs uh, the collaboration of many forces and thank you for doing that and of course all uh, the members uh, uh, related to the project to the, to the play thank you very much for doing that on uh, March 15th and um, as you said uh, uh, before we get to the presentation uh, let me take a, an extra minute and, uh, and uh, with you to, to express uh, um, our, our, our you know uh, condemnation uh, against the war in Ukraine and, and, and express also uh, our, our, our sympathies and our thoughts are with uh, the people of U Ukraine and also the fellow um, New Yorkers, which is about 150,000 uh, Ukrainians here and uh, many of them are either CUNY students uh, or, or staff and, and Queens College students and staff. And I want to express our support and and, and, and uh, understanding uh, with them. Um, when uh, Lou uh, asked me to, to participate at today's event, uh, I, I was uh, uh, both surprised and uh, in a good way and, and uh, intrigued because the case of Onassis um, gives us a chance to realize many th other things regarding um, uh, Greece itself and also uh, the history of immigration of the diaspora. And uh, this is how I approach uh, uh, this presentation uh, and I would like to share it, to share it with you, uh, with your permission. So I accept it uh, with, uh, you know, with joy because it, gives gives this opportunity to realize uh, uh, certain things first of all uh, one thing i would like to mention is is to go beyond the biographies and and, and realize the general aspect to see uh, to realize history and sociology of greece not only as chronology uh, or rhetoric but rather to see uh, the struggle of of, um, of um, certain people uh, of, of of the whole uh, 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 state, a new state, uh, a new, uh, an, an old nation uh, to uh, achieve unification, to liberate, to, to liberate uh, the remaining of, of, of places. And uh, in, this, in this perspective, I would like to see it. So taking um, in a very uh, subjective way, certain um, uh, incidents, dates, regarding uh, Onassis' uh, uh, life, I compare it or I introduce, uh, again, some selective because we have very little time now, but it is a basis to, to think more later about it. Uh, as as you, you mentioned, Lou, he was born in 1906. In 1906, uh, Greece came out from 
uh, defeated from, from the, the, uh, the unfortunate war of 1897, and it was already uh, under international financial supervision. Uh, we had an early attempt, uh, an early uh, uh, military coup uh, in Gudi in 1909. Uh, we have the appearance of Eleferius Venizelos as the prime minister. Of course, the Balkan Wars of 12 and 13 and the liberation of uh, Thessaloniki from the, from, from the uh, Turks. Uh, Greece enters the, second, uh, the, the First World War and we have uh, uh, the, the uh, very uh, ambiguous, very uh, intriguing uh, intervenience of the great powers, which is another issue uh, that I bring into the table in, into our discussion today, uh, not only to uh, re-examine uh, uh, the internal politics of Greece, but seriously to re-examine the role of the foreign factor. What was the role of the foreign factor uh, uh, and how it has influenced uh, Greek politics? Uh, and of course, the, 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 the uh, understanding, the creation, uh, and, and, and the, the, uh, uh, the epitome of, of the great idea. Uh, when uh, the Greek troops uh, uh, reached Smyrna in 1919, uh, uh, of course, in 1920, we have a very important uh, treaty, uh, the Treaty of, of, of Severus, where Greece becomes uh, the Greece of the two continents and the five seas. Unfortunately, that was reversed a few years later. Uh, at the same time, we have the first mass, mass immigration wave from Greece to, to America. Almost half a million uh, people immigrated to the States at this time between 19, um, 1900 and 1920s, uh, massively from um, uh, a country of uh, four or five million half a million to leave for, for, for America alone was a huge, a huge number. Of course, here we have another problem as researchers studying Greeks in America because a lot of people who came from Asia Minor, they didn't come with uh, a Greek passport. And the way that the, um, uh, the American immigration agencies uh, counted people who entered the country was uh, only the passport. So we, we missed uh, uh, many people uh, to count as, as Greeks, which is another uh, issue as far as concern research on the Greek American community. What do we see here? Uh, we see the second uh, decade of, of his life between 1920 and 1930. Uh, of course, uh, the main event here is the burning of Osmosmyrna and the Asia Minor catastrophe or disaster. Uh, the, the exchange uh, of population between Greece and Turkey in 1923, which is the year that, uh, that uh, Onassis uh, uh, immigrates, moves to, to, to Argentina. Uh, and in very few years, uh, we realize that uh, not only he obtains uh, the Argentine citizenship, but also he's, he's able uh, to uh, buy uh, cargo ships and um, in order to uh, make his business easier and more profitable, um, importing tobacco from, uh, from, uh, from Europe and Greece and Turkey. Uh, it is also the, uh, the time when we have uh, British getting uh, Cyprus as, as a colony um, uh, in that period. As far as concerned the Greeks in America, we have the anti-immigration laws uh, and uh, for Greece, which is not considered exactly uh, a white, uh, a white uh, nation, uh, uh, was imposed a quota. So it was a ban of immigration for, from, from Asia, uh, China in particular, and also for Southern uh, uh, Europeans who did not qualify exactly as white. And also in that period, it was a period of um, uh, discrimination against the Greeks uh, after all, uh, the establishment of AHEPA um, uh, in 1922, uh, one of the reasons uh, was to um, defend, to protect uh, the Greek American community against the Ku Klux Klan and other discriminatory uh, incidents. In the following decade, between 1930 and 40, uh, when we have the Great Depression, of course, uh, 
Onassis managed to, to buy the, the, the cargo ships, move to, to London, uh, and um, he, he, he's ready to uh, have his uh, first uh, big oil tanker in, 19, in late 1938. Of course, uh, the, the beginning of the war changed uh, the plans. Uh, what do we have also in Greece? It is uh, tremendous political instability. One government uh, um, um, falls and another comes. Uh, and in 1936, we have um, the, the Metaxas dictatorship of August 4th. And moving towards uh, uh, the end of that decade, uh, we have uh, the, the Second World War. Uh, the Greeks with uh, the No, the Ochi, and, and the Greek epos. Uh, play a significant role as far as concerned Greeks in America because uh, the resistance and the heroics uh, of, of Greece, of Greeks in, in Greece uh, during the war, uh, enable uh, the, the gave an opportunity to the American mainstream uh, uh, to realize uh, uh, Greece, understand Greece better, and and accept starting accepting the Greek Americans uh, to the uh, host society here uh, in, in in America. Uh, and it is the time, of course, that uh, uh, Onassis will come to New York in, in, in the following decade. He moves to New York and uh, he manages to, uh, to strike a deal in uh, leasing, uh, leasing uh, the, the, the six uh, ships that he had to the Allies war effort. Uh, he has his uh, first marriage uh, with Tina Livanos, one of the most prominent uh, uh, um, economic uh, uh, families in Greece, uh, the Livados family in 1946, and he, he moves to oil tankers. At the same time, Greece suffers uh, a very, very uh, uh, brutal occupation uh, by the Germans, uh, famine, uh, of course, the, the heroic uh, resistance of Greece and uh, moving to liberation in 1944. Uh, and while Greece uh, uh, and the Greek people uh, fought so uh, uh, um, he uh, heroically. In 1944, we have the, the Kembriana, the December uh, uh, incident, when uh, police and, and British soldiers uh, start shooting at the uh, peaceful uh, de demonstrators in, in Athens. Uh, as a result, with other political implications, especially uh, the British, at the beginning of the American uh, in, intervening uh, in Greece, we have the Greek Civil War uh, between 1946 and 1949, and the famous Truman Doctrine and Master Plan. Uh, uh, as far as concerned, the Greek Americans uh, uh, in, in New York, by the end of the war, by the end of that decade, it, it was a well-established Greek American community here in New York and in other places. And um, continuing uh, between 50 and 60s, it is uh, 1957 when Onassis meets Maria Callas, and they start an affair. Uh, uh, at that time, that lasted uh, about uh, nine, 10 years. Uh, what we have uh, in, uh, in Greece and Cyprus it is an effort to uh, end of Enosis, to, to unite uh, uh, Cyprus and Greece. But of course, that never happened because of the British uh, intervention. Uh, finally, uh, uh, just before his his death, uh, his his death between 1960 and 70, when he he meets um, uh, um, Jackie O uh, in 1968, uh, continuously Greece suffers from political instability uh, that interrupts all. Uh, uh, good things that uh, were started to happen in Greece uh, in that decade. Uh, all socioeconomic progress, the movement was interrupted, especially brutally, with uh, uh, the military junta of 1967. Uh, at the same time, uh, there is a second uh, mass immigration uh, uh, wave from Greece to America. Probably Greece, uh, uh, with the only exception, uh, the, the southern Italians, we are the only a European group that immigrated massively uh, into, uh, in, into the same uh, 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 century. Uh, never reached the, the half a million Greeks of the first wave, but at least 250,000 Greeks immigrated to the States. And we have 
um, uh, the new enclave, the creation of the new enclave uh, from Manhattan of the old immigration of Brooklyn, uh, uh, the new enclave, the ethnic enclave is now Queens and Astoria in particular. Finally, the five, uh, to the last five years of his life, um, Alexander Onassis, uh, I think uh, by, uh, by far the most uh, devastating uh, event, tragic event was uh, the, the death of his son, of um, Alexandros uh, Onassis in 1973. Uh, there are many uh, scenarios there. If it was an accident, it was not, not an accident, uh, but in any case, that was a very traumatic uh, uh, event. Uh, of course, in Greece in 1973, we have uh, the protest of uh, the students in the Polytechnic, uh, the fall of Hunda in 1944, and the unfortunate event of the Turkish invasion of Cyprus, which still uh, it is uh, unresolved. Uh, there is the abolition of monarchy. And in 1977, on the death of, of Onassis, we have a new constitution in Greece and a new era of the metapolitics of the post-Hunda uh, era uh, started in the Third Republics. Uh, Republic started. Uh, uh, Greeks in America at the same time saw the, the early signs of socioeconomic mobility. And at, at that period, we have probably for the first time, um, uh, as far as concerned, the Greek American community, huge uh, political mobili mobilization due to the Cyprus issue. Uh, at the same time, we have the establishment of many modern Greek study programs in various US universities uh, in, uh, in America. One example is what we have here at Queens College, um, uh, the Center for uh, Byzantine and Modern Greek Studies, established in, in 1976. So this is a story uh, going be using the biography of Onassis to realize some historical issues regarding Greece uh, give us the opportunity to see uh, the movement, um, the, the, the mass immigration movements uh, of Greeks to the States. And, and it is a great opportunity to re-examine historical issues as far as concerned the ideological issues uh, uh, around that time to uh, liberate, uh, uh, to conclude the liberation movement that started with the Greek Revolution uh, with Esmirna and, and, and other areas uh, to re-examine the role of the Greek elites uh, and their role and involvement uh, with Greek politics and also to realize uh, also how uh, the uh, immigration movement was also affected by all those uh, international events. Thank you very much uh, for, for, for your patience. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Nico, for that. And uh, I, just, I just can't get over, uh, to be frank, I can't get over uh, Lou when he was mentioning, when he was mentioning Onassis and how he was as a young man. Um, and certainly the relationship with his father, his father being someone stern, uh, Onassis uh, getting in and out of schools, Onassis interested in other things, not necessarily the type of things that his father was interested in. Uh, you, you mentioned, Nico, that, uh, you know, he got his Argentinian citizenship, but if I'm not mistaken, I think he got his Argentinian citizenship by saying that uh, he was born in Thessaloniki. <laughs> and, and, I, and I think he mentioned, he mentioned that because the fellow who sat at the desk who would affect uh, him getting his, uh, his uh, uh, citizenship in Argentina. He knew that you know, he, he had some friends or some relationship with somebody from, from, uh, from Thessaloniki because in, in his early life, he was working as, I guess, an operator in the evening. He was an electrician, I guess, during the day in the evening. He was an operator listening into phone calls and figuring out what people were talking to each other so he could take advantage of them. And uh, we'll get into it a little bit later, but he, yeah. you know, he was a, he was a character. Yeah, he was course. he was bigger than life. Okay. And uh, you, you didn't mention in Argentina Claudia Nuzio, Nuzio. who uh, you know that great opera the singer, the opera singer, yeah, the opera singer that uh, yeah. you know he was, was he was at that time he was into tobacco, and then he got her you know he created his own cigarette brand. And how to smoke it, etc. So everybody could all of a sudden buy his, yeah. his cigarettes. Yeah. Well, we'll get into that in a second. Yeah. But I'm sorry, Nico. Go ahead. Uh, no, I, I, uh, 
because you brought it up, as I said, we need to examine certain things. And since um, we mentioned one or two, uh, um, one or two times, the relationship with the father, um, unfortunately, um, we haven't seen the play yet, and uh, I'm looking forward to see it. And probably uh, uh, both uh, Anthony and 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 Dikran will will, will uh, uh, illuminate uh, certain things. Also, uh, to some extent, he revisited, he he recreated this uh, antagonistic relationship with his own son um, Alexander Ar Ar Aristotle. Um, he was also a little bit competitive and, and a little bit uh, 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 strict with his, with his father, recreating uh, to some extent the relationship uh, he had with his own father. And so this is uh, something that... Uh, um, Listen, we're, we're, here to, we're here to talk about we're here to talk about one of the most interesting people in, uh, in the history of the world, quite frankly. And uh, he had certain attributes. Uh, one of them was <laughs> was discussed by Lou, where he said he had this uh, this interest, quite frankly, uh, and he was he was a player. He was a player. With that, I'll introduce uh, his relationship with uh, with uh, women and all this. Those are interesting things to discuss. Yeah, to bring it. To... Not 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 only that. I mean, again, uh, he was he was a very interesting character. He, like I said, he would in, he would listen to conversations, figure out what was going on. Uh, knowing that the depression was coming and he can he can buy six ships for like half the price or what have you, and then uh, go to the U.S. government when they needed to ship weapons uh, into Europe, et cetera, you know, to make a deal with them that after the war he would get uh, he would get uh, ships at a, at a special price, et cetera. This is this is a guy who's who's very interesting with that. I'm going to introduce uh, our next uh, panelist, uh, uh, Anthony George Scordy. Uh, Anthony Scordi is the creator of the play Onassis, uh, a Greek Cypriot born and raised in London who retains strong ties with both Athens and Cyprus, as well as the United States, of course. He attended uh, Drama Central London and later toured with the Royal Shakespeare Company and Vanessa Gra uh, Redgrave's Moving Theatre uh, Company. He had an extensive uh, uh, TV, film, video game and stage career. He is known, among others, for his roles uh, as Admiral Garrick Versio in Star Wars Battlefront II and the dealer in the Hand of Fate series of games. In addition to his voiceover work in video games, he has uh, narrated audiobooks and has worked on screen and stage as an actor, producer, and writer. His work in television continued in the United States, where he featured in episodes of Scorpion, the Blacklist, The Last Ship, and others. British TV appearances included uh, include a series regular as Silas Manatos in Prime Suspect 1972, and is also a prolific film actor. Anthony has appeared in the uh, Golden Globe 2020 uh, nominated miniseries Catch-22. His upcoming projects include acting as Carlo Gambino, in the Paramount series, The Offer, as Pinky in The Seven Faces of Jane, and as Frank in The Ghosts of Monday. Welcome, Anthony, and thank you for being with us today. Hi, hi. Let me unmute, let me unmute. Hi, it's a pleasure to be amongst you all, the, you, you esteemed and learned people. So uh, it's an honor. I don't, know about, I don't know about that, but it sounds good. <laughs> well, it's the truth. I mean, you know, uh, I, I won't take up too much time. We're here to speak about Anassis. And uh, I have to say, I read at least 10 biographies on the man. And it was, uh, I had to read the white bits. I couldn't read the black bits. The black bits weren't uh, something that I believed was true. Uh, I, I sense that I have sensed he was a man that was not loved by uh, the Anglo. Um, we were uh, undesirables in America at that point in time. And that's why. He went to Argentina. The most difficult thing for me right now is to say I went to Argentina. You know, it was he went to Argentina. Yes, indeed. He was, um, as I say in the play, he was a prankster more than anything else. And there is a story about where he said to his school teacher, listen, we want to go and light candles for this same thing. And instead he went with cigars that he'd taken from his father's store and um, went to the harlots, shall we say to the Harlot's house. Um, 
there were many stories uh, that from his younger years, for instance, a friend of his was selling lift windmills on, on wooden sticks, paper, made from paper and a pin, and he was selling them for a certain price. And uh, uh, an asset said to him, um, how much do you pay for the pin? How much was the wood? He said, well, you, you, you're robbing yourself. And then once a factory burnt down, a pencil factory, went and collected all the pencils, cut them in half, sharpened them, sold them for half price, <laughs> what they were being normally sold for. So, you know, that, that entrepreneurial spirit was in him. And indeed, those six frigates that he bought from Canada during the Great Depression, the Great Depression, when men were jumping off buildings, he went to Canada and... Um, He'd creep, crawl into these holes in the ship and come out and go, yeah. He didn't know a thing about ships, but he'd come out and be like, oh, yeah, no. And he knocked the price down of these six frigates. And indeed, one of them ended up being Christina, Christina O, which was, um, I think, uh, his uh, vessel for his odyssey, for his Iliad, for his Ithaca, looking for his Ithaca. Yeah, a refugee. Um, witnessed many horrors. I've taken some liberty. I mentioned his uncle and his close relationship with, with his uncle and his yaya, um, who instilled the, the uh, religious aspect into him, and his uncle, who I have him telling stories about Mira, about fate, about destiny. So I juxtapose those two things. Uh, I do talk about Claudia Muzio uh, making his first million at the age of 23, there are discrepancies in age. And I noticed you didn't mention a birth date because the fact is, yeah, 1900 or 1906, was it 15th of January or was it 20th of January? So there are different things everywhere. But I finally read, now for the life of me, I don't remember who the journalists were, but it was a, a group of independent newspaper journalists from the independent UK who had written this biography, which everything that I had read between the lines was in that book. So, um, yes, a man that basically, with his cousin, was sharing a bed in Argentina. <laughs> One was sleeping during the day, he was working at night, you know, uh, and, you know, sitting there with his first money with the soup, um, and one shirt, one tie, and nursing one drink all night in the most popular uh, elitist clubs in Argentina. Um, um, met the right people, and he continued doing that till he got to where he felt he needed to be. And I think the play is about, you know, it stops being about the business, about making money, and it becomes about the game of making the money. And... Uh, I think I, I, I focused towards the latter, yes. And his demise, what killed him, what took him out was uh, Alexandros, his death. He died within two years of, you know, of his son's death. And it bears saying this, that Maria died two years after that. So was she the love of his life? So I'll, I'll leave it there because everybody's been very, 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 very informative. And a, 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 a lot of that is actually in the play. Dick, Dick Ryan, if you can, just, just shut down, just uh, shut the, uh, just mute yourself for a second so that we don't get the reverberations. Let me ask you a question. What, what uh, possessed you to write, to write uh, Onassis and to, and to produce it? Um, well, a few, uh, uh, long story, longer, I uh, was working on set with another Greek, Teo Penglis, who's in Days of Our Lives on something. And he said, oh, Anthony, you know, you look like an asses. And I wanted to swear at him. And I, you know, <laughs> <laughs> well, how dare you? How dare you? You know, we know the headlines, Toad to Marry Princess, you know, Jackie, how could you? You know, a beauty in the beast. I thought, you know, is that a compliment? No, it's not. You know, unless my wallet looks like his, his which it doesn't. Um, uh, I, he, I went home and started researching it, and I looked at, I looked at the Wikipedia, and I thought, no, this is not, this can't be right. So I started with one biography, and then I read another one, and then I read another, I read ten in total, and I remember thinking a few weeks before that, you know, musicians can busk, you know, actors have to like need a troop of other actors. And I thought, and then when I read this, I thought this story needs to be told. 
you know, because I don't want to describe Anassis as the woman, the, the man that married Jackie O. I'm, you know, Jackie O, is, Jackie Onassis is the woman that married Aristotle Onassis. You know, and there's a story which isn't in the play, but uh, uh, when he was dying, in a, in a, in a, and this, you know, I have to say this, he could have gone anywhere in the world, anywhere in the world when he was sick with myasthenia gravis. Anywhere, he chose to go to Paris. Who was in Paris? Maria Callas. And she had nothing to do with him after he started the relationship with Jackie, with Jackie Kennedy and Assis. And um, Jackie, well, um, after his gallbladder operation that he had, which is eventually supposedly what took him out, um, uh, uh, Jackie was in there arguing with Christina, his daughter, um, what she would get in the will. And they came, and she was a much better businesswoman than Alexandra ever was, because Alexandra was only interested in flying. But, you know, my son, you know, um, she came to a deal that she would get 26 million as long as she kept the name Anassis, which is why, in fact, she's called Jackie Kennedy Anassis on her tombstone, which, you know, and, and it's very interesting. I think it was Nicholas that mentioned the relationship between his father and himself. And I think, oh man, that's so obvious. You know, I don't need, but I show that. In fact, I almost verbatim repeat what my father said to me so you know we're doomed to you know to make the same mistakes it's like when i have kids i'm not going to raise them the way i was raised and indeed very similar words come out of anastasia's mouth and inevitably um that's what happens you know I thank you so I, much thank you so reason. much anthony thank you uh our next uh, our next panelist is uh dick rantulane uh, Dick Ran is the director of An Evening with Onassis. Uh, he has trained at, uh, at Drama Center London a few years before Anthony. I don't know why he mentions that. <laughs> okay. He's of uh, Armenian and Welsh descent. Uh, he has worked in significant roles in both uh, British theater, American theater, and film. He has been an actor in Britain for 10 years and in the U.S. for the last uh, 20 years. Uh, Dick Ran first directed Ifiyenya in London in uh, 1982. He is interested in one person work in the tradition of Homer, the original playwright. Uh, Dick Rand has directed uh, in uh, Galileo, uh, Brecht, Anthony and Cleopatra, A Christmas Carol, Passion in the Desert, Mask of Apollo, Sykes and Nancy, A Christmas Carol, A Christmas Story, Richard Burton, Mello E. Bernard, uh, Pomerantz, uh, Onassis, of course, by Anthony Scordy, and right now, uh, Coriolanus on Zoom. Welcome, Dick Rand, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you, and th thank you all for what you've, uh, Anthony, can you turn yours down? So I don't hear. Um, thank you all, and thank you all for what you said, because it's helped me out with what I have to say. Um, it strikes me suddenly that quite coincidentally to my participation in the project, I'm a quarter Armenian. Uh, maybe that's not so coincidental in the end. Um, so what I've been thinking about the, the play really is that um, I've done a lot of work, a lot of Shakespeare, and Shakespeare is generally written about sort of great human beings. And, um, uh, Onassis certainly has become in the process of making this play. I hadn't really studied him before. Anthony came to me with the play. He's a great human being, was a great human being, without doubt. And I was struck listening to you all that um, in the Shakespearean sense, he begins as a kind of Prince Hal in the play you know, rebelling against his father. He's a, he's a playboy while his father's a stern, slightly dreary businessman. And then he becomes a, as it were, a Mark Antony, an opportunist, a lover. And in the play, he ends up being quite quickly King Lear. Um, and, and I, you know, Antony in the performance quite seriously, goes through those three archetypal phases. Um, and that's what has grown on me as I've worked on the play, 
how clear those phases are in any great human being's life. And the fact that as in Shakespeare, as in many classical plays and as in, you know, the reference to Odysseus, um, um, great misfortune and, and struggle in some of us produces a kind of um, thrill with life, a kind of um, an arete, I think it's called, an energy, a courage. And that's what's so clear as we come out of Smyrna and as he goes to Argentina, I am, he says, I'm built for storms. Life is stormy, I am built for storms. And, and it's just, to me, it's just a great, a great, great celebration of that kind of a personality and that kind of a psyche. I did look, I did wonder whether, because we've had such faux great men recently, great human beings recently, you know, they're advertised great human beings, where in fact they're born with $40 million in the trust fund. Um, uh, I did wonder whether there was any fraudulence in his tale. And as I studied him, since we started the play, I studied him, I was really struck by the photographs of him. And in the photographs, I see a great seriousness, a great gravity, sometimes tremendous fun. I don't see any narcissism. And I think in this way, he's a gift to us today, because that's very rare amongst people who imagine themselves to be significant in, in our world today. He, he seems to me, as, as per Mark Antony, he seems to be um, uh, at the mercy of his own desires and of his own loves, which I find very admirable. Um, and extremely honest. And um, that's what Anthony made in the play. And um, without embarrassing him, uh, um, he wrote the part. And my sense is that um, cometh the part, cometh the actor. Anthony is capable of presenting us with that story of this force of nature, um, very rare in our world today, probably then also. And I think that's the secret of his success. I, I think it's his, um, you know, he's in the world of business. So he, he sells a hundred shoes, he sells a hundred right shoes. And then the guy calls up wanting the left shoe and he says, well, you have to buy them also. So he is a bit of a crook, but he's, he's, he's an extremely uh, honest man with a great kind of primal integrity that I just love. Um, and I saw the play in Atlanta, I saw it grow. And, uh, and I think his, Anthony's style of playing is rare. Um, he, he, he engages you in the audience, he's having a conversation with you. Um, and, you know, there is, it's a strange thing in plays that, especially now is that certain kinds of men do not go to see plays. Maybe they were like um, Onassis at the opera. But I, I think particularly, this is the kind of a play that that community would really like to go and see because hopefully they will see themselves reflected on the stage. Um, yeah, so that's my, that's my thing. Thank you so much, Dick Wren. And when, when you were speaking and other people were speaking, I, you know, I just, uh, uh, things were flashing through my, through my mind. One, one of the things that was flashing in my mind is, is you mentioned the King Lear aspect, but then again, then again, he died on March 15th, the, the Ides of March. The Ides of so, March. So, so you know, we're thinking of like, like, is this like a Caesar character? Who knows in terms of what he? No, does. he is. No, that's yeah. very good. He is very much a Caesar yeah. character, but without the pretense, he's not a politician. 
you know. Yeah, but long very run. true. But but you also mentioned you also mentioned and every uh, a couple of people mentioned Odysseus. Yeah. Okay, and Odysseus, if we remember Odysseus, he was always referred to as cunning Odysseus, cunning Odysseus. In other words, his his intelligence, his genius, or what have you had to do with what the Hellenic people, I think, would call poniria. In other words, he had the cunning intelligence. Yeah. So he was he was not so much a trickster, but but it was a fascinating, fascinating uh, character. And with that, I'm going to go to our, uh, you know, just our uh, final pan uh, panelists, and then we'll open up the discussion to everyone to ask any questions they like, uh, to have an open discussion. Uh, and that's uh, George Zuvalis. You're with us, George, correct? Is George with us? He was. He is. George, are you with us? I am. Okay. And okay. Very good. Uh, George is the assistant director of An Evening with Onassis, representing his maiden voyage into the world of Broadway theatrical directors. Uh, he is a SAG uh, after actor and an award winning writer and actor with 37 wins, 10 nominations and 18 additional awards garnered for creating, writing, acting, directing, and producing television and film content, which includes his multi-film festival wins for best actor, best director, best film, best screenplay, uh, television and film content. Uh, he was part of creating and producing, uh, and he appears among others on, uh, and appeared among others on Amazon Prime, Apple TV, uh, Peacock, Tubi, Cos uh, uh, Cosmo, and Sling. Uh, he has served as the daytime e Emmy uh, judge for the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences. My good friend, the best, the best, I'm not going to say the best friend, but a good friend, uh, George Zuvalis. Welcome, George. Hello, everybody. Um, it's just such an honor for me to be here with you, Lou, the three professors in the room, and with two very, very talented and gifted people I've learned to look, look up to. When I went down to Atlanta to see the rehearsals of um, Anthony as he was getting ready for his shows in Atlanta, and then I saw the one-on-one -on -one directing that a director does with the actor, intimate and close, unlike some of the roles that I get, I don't get that kind of directing, right? It's like, uh, say this, say that, and, you know, it's a different caliber of acting uh it is stage acting it is shakespearean acting it's powerful and the different kinds of characters that anthony is able to transition into and to have the mannerisms the joys um being raised here in new york i've witnessed larger than life characters like onassis that have gone from richest, uh, from poorest to richest. Some people, Lou, you started out pushing a, a, a peanut cart down uh, in the corner of uh, Manhattan. John Katsimatidis was bagging groceries at Christidis. He later bought it. So my entire life, I've been happy to witness people that are able to transcend their positions in society. And Anthony is able to show how he comes from Smyrna as Onassis, dealing with a very overbearing dad, falling in love with the antics of his uncle, which he gets a lot of his lessons from, having the reverence for his grandmother, who was fervently a Christian, and then going to Argentina and then starting his empire, almost from rags to riches, re-examining re his life and I think it's, it's, it is a Ulyssian journey. I think it's a, a Odyssean journey. I think it is something that once it's brought on stage at the American Theater of Actors, people will learn how to reappreciate the theater as performed by Anthony Scordy and as directed by Dick Grant Tulane. And again, I'm honored to be here today with everybody. And uh, let's get to some questions. Uh, Anthony, they keep mentioning they keep mentioning uh, the play. Can can you just give us, you know, a little bit of verbiage from the play, playing Onassis himself to the audience? Oh my God! Uh, I'm sorry to do this to you. Can you? 
uh, the, 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 the railway between Europe and the East is created. I should just jump from that bit, Dick ran to, and the Turks. What? Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. May their wives be widows and their children orphans. They want to destroy our beautiful world. They have one goal. Dick Ren, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Anthony. Dick Ren, can you just mute yourself a second? Because I know you guys are near each other. Go ahead. They have My one apology. to drive every Greek, Armenian, and Jew out of Asia Minor. The genocide becomes legal, and it is no longer a criminal offense to kill a Greek. A friend of my father's comes to the house, an Armenian friend of my father's comes to the house and tells us of what he has just witnessed. A mob of Turks tearing a priest apart, limb from limb, gouging his eyes out with knives and sticks and crucifying him on a church door. My father tells him to hold your tongue, not in front of the boy. Meanwhile, Yaya, <laughs> Yaya makes us all kneel and pray for the priest's soul and for the souls of the assassins. I'll leave it there because I then I'll start doing yeah yeah, and I don't want to start doing giving too much. Yeah, uh, I don't know when when I when I hear the word assassins, I think bravo, of, bravo, of, bravo, 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 bravo. When I think of when I think of assassins, I think of the of, uh, you know the the guys who were with hashish uh, as, as as I guess where they got they got their original name, uh, Ismini. Um, your book, which is coming out, tell us a little bit about the book. When is it coming out? What's happening? We're really fascinated by that. Well, I don't want to reveal very much. So I will tell you right now is uh, with the editor and uh, uh, part of the problem is to get it out in time and trying to make it shorter and all that. But I won't say any more. I will keep you all in suspense. Can you, can you tell us if it's coming out this year? Which is hopefully <laughs> okay because this is the 200th anniversary and we want to have you back when a book comes out and you know sell books. Uh, so so you know we're rooting for you, <clears throat> Lou. Thank you brought you. you you brought up you brought up the uh, the aspect of the character of Onassis when he was a young when he was a young boy. Who knows whether he was 16 or what age he was, but he he had some. Um, a personality, quite frankly, that he took with him, I guess, for the rest of his life, from what I've gathered. Uh, tell us a little bit about that, because you started this conversation. And really, when you look at Onassis's life, he basically was the same way, whether he was in Argentina or Paris or wherever. You know, once again, I think understanding Onassis is kind of rooted in understanding Smyrna. And, you know, uh, there were more Greeks in Smyrna than there were in Athens. Athens was a dusty village compared to Smyrna. Salonika was a slum compared to Smyrna. And Beirut, Beirut you know, and uh, was, a, was sort of a lesser light than Smyrna. It was really an extraordinary place. People were having a good time and, uh, and you know, and the younger Onassis fit into that very well. They were crazy for soccer, for football. They had, a, you know, their own team and, and I'm, I'm, Ismini, maybe you could help me with this. I'm trying to remember. It seems to me, um, and I'd have to go back and look on my book. I don't know if I included it or not. Um, I think the Greeks at Smyrna fielded a team at the first, at, at the uh, early Olympics, a modern Olympics. And I think Onassis may have been on the swim team. Do you know if that's true or not? I really do not know about that, but that is a very interesting detail. To he was research. a very good swimmer. He was very athletic. He was a very good swimmer. He was muscular, small and muscular. And so he was always at the football games. He, you know, he was doing all of these things, having a blast. And as many people were, and you know, the cafes of course in Smyrna were famous for the music, you know, this combination of, of music from many, many different sources. And the dancing, you know, the Greek dancing, you know, which is in large part Turkish dancing. Um, <clears throat> you know, he was involved in all of that, having a good time. He had friends. He had a Turkish girlfriend, you know, among when he had a steady girlfriend, it was a Turkish girl. <clears throat> so, you know, it's interesting, um, this sort of polyglot culture that we had at Smyrna. Um, there were five different languages being spoken. 
you know, the Greeks ate Armenian food, uh, the Turks ate Greek food. Uh, you know, there was this, this sort of fusion of cultures. And, um, you know, and above everything else, even really above having a great time at Smyrna, there was this sense of enterprise. And, you know, it's interesting to think about that because it was absent from the nation of Greece. You know, we don't see this in Athens or in the, you know, the Peloponnesus and so forth at this time. We see it, there was a kind of um, starburst of energy around new business, wealth formation, trying out new things in Smyrna that wasn't happening in the nation of Greece. And all of this rubbed off on Aristotle and it became part of who he was. The fun, the entrepreneurship, the adventure, the love of people. You know, he loved people, right? Being with people, making love to women, drink. You know, all of this was part of his uh, big personality. And in some ways, he was emblematic of the of the better parts, the fun parts of the city of Smyrna. Well, I think in terms of what you were saying, Lou, uh, don't forget that there was a there was a radical difference between the people who are who remained in the Ottoman Empire and those who who broke away, let's say, in the revolution. Right. What is the what is the mainland of Greece uh, at, at, in the past was the backwater of the empire. I mean, most of the trade, as you know, whether it was Smyrna, whether it was Constantinople or some of the other cities around the, the Ottoman Empire, including obviously the parts of the Ottoman Empire, which were parts of the what we now call the Middle East, et cetera. Right. They were they the the merchants, the merchants of the Ottoman Empire were, in fact, the Greeks, the Armenians and the Jews. That's right. The uh, the uh, Ottomans themselves never partook in those particular uh, things. So their traditions were different. Again, they were more cosmopolitan, as you indicated. They spoke multiple languages. All of them spoke multiple languages, right. whether it was Greek, Armenian, and it didn't matter what they were. Uh, they would speak each other's languages because that was the language of trade for hundreds right. of years uh, during the Ottoman Empire. So uh, it's, 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 it's easy to understand why, why, in fact, when you had first the, the nation of Greece, which took place and had a revolution in a place that was uh, more again, uh, you know, more again, more aggressive, more wild, uh, part of the empire, but again, again, uh, a part of the empire that in many cases uh, was difficult to control, if you know what I'm saying. Trade was not their big thing. In right. many cases, their big thing was being clefts being up in the mountains and robbing, robbing other people. So uh, it's easy to understand. It's easy to understand that that aspect of, let's say, the Eastern, the Eastern Hellenes. And, and it became a problem, obviously, when they had the population exchange in, uh, in 1923. And as Mini talked about it, uh, and I, and I uh, and mentioned the, uh, the Turkosporus and all the rest of that, there was an animosity between those refugees and the people who were in Greece. Because they were they were in effect different people, you know, they yeah, different backgrounds, right. different different people. Uh, yeah. Ismini, do you, do you want to or uh, or Nico, do you want to talk about that? Because there was a lot of discrimination uh, of those people who came from Asia Minor, not only from Asia Minor but also uh, from the Pontos area, the the, the, the Ponte Greeks, uh, when they when they in fact settled in areas in many cases up in the north in Macedonia and Epirus because those were the areas that were last uh, conquered, let's say, by, uh, in terms of the Balkan Wars. Nico, Ismini, anyone? Yeah, well, I have, I have to, oh. Please, yeah. No, that's okay, go ahead. Okay. I just wanted to say, yes, there were a lot of people, but there were people who were very compassionate towards the refugees. They, Greeks have suffered uh, uh, many a disaster, shall we say, so they were compassionate. And, and kind, but certainly not everybody agree. I think perhaps I can illustrate that with uh, uh, the experience of my family. Uh, my, from my father's side, my grandfather would take money and food and whatever he could close to refugees uh, in different parts of Athens. And frequently he would take my father along. And that's how I, I know um, they were doing that. My grandmother, however, was very, very opposed to that. So they had to do it in secret. And if she found out, 
it was a big problem uh, in our family. So even within the family, there was a sort of a division about um, how to receive uh, the refugees and highlighting similarities or differences, what makes us apart, takes us apart. That's a good point. You know, um, when I was doing research for the book, I did a very deep dive into the academic uh, work that's been done on Smyrna and um, uh, spoke to some of the, you know, the, the great historians who were still alive, you know, who were alive and doing their academic work in, in Greece and so forth. Great respect for all of them. But I, I came away as an American, not as a Greek, but I came away as an American uh, and I still have this feeling that I haven't fully um, been able to sort of graph out that Greece has not come to terms as a nation with what happened at Smyrna. There is not a lo lot of good academic work on Smyrna. You start talking to a, a Greek historian in Greece at the University of Athens, let's say, about Smyrna, and they want to talk about 19th century romanticism or 19th century uh, nationalism or about the French Revolution. It's very hard to get Greek historians in Greece to focus on what happened in Asia Minor in 1922. And I, I have a, I've come to understand it a little bit more and it's tied up in academic politics and, and contemporary politics in Greece and so forth. But you know, think about the Armenians and the way they've embraced their genocide. And think about the way the Jews have embraced what happened to them and have made, have built their modern identity around the Holocaust, right? Uh, and then you think about the Greek encounter with the losses in Asia Minor, and it's not there. There's arguments between the Pontians and the Ionians. And then there's the whole thing about who's more Greek, me or you, you know? And I mean, I saw this a little bit in my, in my, my, my mother was Greek and I'm very proud of that. But, you know, I could see that there, you know, they were from the Peloponnesus. And so they were more Greek than the Albanians, you know? I mean, I, hear, I would hear these arguments all the time. So there's something that, that, ha that has happened, some trauma, some shame, something exists in the, the, the Greek national consciousness that has not allowed the country to fully come to terms and understand Asia Minor and the catastrophe at Smyrna, in my American opinion. Well, I, I agree with you. Uh, don't forget, don't forget, there is that, uh, even, even within the genocide populations, okay, you have East Thrace, you have Asia Minor, and you have Pontus, as you indicated. Right. Amongst themselves, they have three different dates to recognize these particular circumstances. Right. Uh, you have when, when, when people are going to, uh, let's say, the, the U.S. Uh, Congress to, uh, to discuss genocide, you have people pushing the Pontian genocide, not recognizing the other genocides, you know, the East Thracian that we talked about and, and, the, and the Asia Minor one. There is definitely an issue there. And then there's the issue of recognizing the genocide itself. When you look at the history of, of, the, of what is now the, uh, the Hellenic Republic, they themselves did not recognize within their own country the genocide until decades later. That's right. So, so there's, there's, there's a, a serious issue here. Now, uh, Nico, do you have any sociological uh, thought process on this? Yeah. I'd love to hear it, please. <laughs> Help well, me. Uh, uh, this is how I, I open my, my presentation, right? We need to re-examine uh, historical and, and sociological uh, issues. And uh, all the things that, that you have said so far are, are exactly uh, what we're trying to do here today. Uh, of, uh, there are many reasons, Louis. That's why we need to examine um, our, our history. Uh, th this great uh, uh, play that uh, that uh, you know we we're, we're looking forward to see. And thank you, Anthony, if you give us a, a little bit. It was it, it, it was amazing, and um, and Deacon's uh, presentation, uh, you know, uh, tied it with with uh, the concept of the tragic. Right. Um, after all, the title of my presentation was a Greek Odyssey, which is exactly that. Uh, there are many reasons. I will mention one or two. One reason is that uh, 
um, uh, the, the Greeks that came from abroad as refugees or otherwise, uh, they brought a lot of culture uh, into Greece because historically it was underdeveloped five, 500 years under occupation, etc. Uh, so uh, it was an antagonism. Another thing, it, it is uh, the role of the elites that I, I propose we need to, to re-examine uh, to, to a large extent. The role of the what? Elites, elites. The, the oh, yeah. role of, of the Greek elites, because the, the overwhelming majority of the refugees that came, they were radicals and they had made contributions in the labor movement in music. Look at the Rebetica that uh, Lou uh, and I, uh, we had the chance to have some events and, 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 and make the comparison and association with the American blues. Uh, Marcus Vamakaris, right? All the Asia, Asia Minor uh, musicians that came and they became the Lubin proletariat. So the, the ruling classes in Greece and, and the Greek elites, they had to, to divide the people. So one of the reasons why a lot of those people were marginalized because of political reasons, the, uh, the radical element that they brought and the innovations, the, because they had this open mind, like most of the Greeks of the diaspora and their role that play uh, to the liberation of Greeks from the, even the beginning of the revolution uh, um, of 1821 uh, was due to the Greeks abroad. So it was uh, a tremendous, a tremendous, uh, uh, um, contribution that the Greek elites in order, because they were segmented and supporting different political parties, officially we had the, the British, uh, the British uh, party, the, the Russian party, the French party, so they were a divided elite. Even during the junta, we have uh, uh, one split during the, the, the latest junta of 1967 was uh, Onassis and Papadopoulos that giving him his house, but the other, because he wanted to do uh, the, the new refinery and the other parts of the junta, the other members of the junta, they wanted to support Vardiroyanis and, and Latsis. Uh, so it was another split. So you see, you see the role of the elites is to divide the people in order to gain one piece of, of, of power. But at, the, but at the same time, Lou, I think, I think part of it relates to the fact that in, in mainland Greece in particular, uh, they weren't as cosmopolitan, obviously, yeah. and uh, they were tribal. They were tribal to, right. to a large degree. And, and in right. many cases, they didn't regard other, other Hellenic people as being necessarily Hellenic, if you know what I mean. So yeah, that absolutely. goes back. Yeah, that goes back to what you were saying, actually, because I remember even my my own my own father would say uh, that uh, uh, this particular lady married a Xeno, in other yeah. words, a foreigner. But right. but he, he, and I said Xeno, what what Xeno is he? And he said, but, oh, he's from he's from the other he's from this part of Greece. In other words. <laughs> They but, regarded somebody else from the other part of Greece as being a foreigner because it wasn't one of their people. It is something He's not that, from here. He's from the next village. <laughs> it, 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 it is something that uh, that uh, Professor Lou said before uh, that you know uh, the same in the trauma because on one hand we had um, the the great idea in Megali there to liberate all the previous uh, 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 Greek uh, you know places including Asia Minor etc. Uh, warrior Epiro, right? The Northern uh, Epiros, etc. To liberate uh, our own places. So on one hand, you have this uh, uh, imaginary creation of the great Elas, loving the people that we have to liberate them. And the moment that the whole thing was a catastrophe, a disaster, you, you have this trauma, the same. The same thing with, with the Vietnam. Look, the tragedy uh, with the American history and us here in America and, and Vietnam, right? The, the, the same. Uh, it is a war that we want to, 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 to forget because it's not victorious. But, but, but Nico also, don't forget, you know, we had the Magali there, but the Magali there was mostly, most mostly from, from uh, mainland uh, Greece. The Magali and, there- And the foreign the Magali, factors, and the foreign factors. And the foreign factors. But the Magali there was really not, not uh, prominent within Within the Hellenic people, etc., who lived in Turkey, in a, or what became the uh, 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 Turkey, they did not. They were not interested per se, per no, se, no, no. Greeks, in being part of the Hellenic Republic. They were. They were more interested, quite frankly, in staying where they were because they were doing very well. I was indicate as was indicated by Lou. People were wealthy. They had businesses, this and that. They were doing very well. They had no interest, quite frankly, in in allowing in my opinion, even the Ottoman Empire to collapse. And if it collapsed, 
their interest was basically to be there when it collapsed to sort of take it over, not necessarily to unite with Greece. And that was the other problem, by the way, between the two societies, because one, one part of the society did not, did not want to go with, with uh, being yeah. part of Greece or anything else. It's similar, when we talk about the revolution, it's similar to what had happened in Chios and the massacre of Chios. The Chotes did not want to be part of the revolution for the most part. There were a few revolutionaries in Chios, but most of these people wanted to stay, you know, within within the Ottoman Empire, uh, actually, because they were doing very well. And uh, obviously, because of what happened, most of them either became slaves or lost their lives. Let's go back to let's go back a little bit to uh, to Anassus. So we let's discuss. Uh, may this I early... say something? Yes, uh, please. Uh, yeah. Because I, I was very intrigued by the point uh, Lou brought up about how uh, the uh, there are no books uh, and no not very much uh, research in Greece within the um, academic world, and what brings to mind is uh, that. Perhaps because they do not have books and research that uh, really explains uh, explains what really happened in Smyrna and how it came about, uh, is one reason why so many Greeks actually do not know the true history. And they've I have frequently heard from friends and relatives, colleagues sometimes. Well, you know. It is 50-50. Both sides uh, committed atrocities, which, of course, it's not the truth. It is very disproportionate. The Turks, um, their atrocities and the way they carried them out were way out there. I won't go into that. But because they do not know history, they kind of whitewash a little bit in their minds uh, what actually happened. I well, not only, right. that, not only that is mean, I think it has to do with the economics, the economics. So they're not they, uh, the government and other, you know, research, you know, organizations, etc. They're not they're not promoting historians to study these things, in my opinion. So they're therefore they're promoting certain aspects of history. So the historians who are there are, are in my opinion, just uh, analyzing the aspect, those type of aspects. But let's go back to Anassas for a let second. Let me just say, let me just say, yeah, that, Lou. To that, Lou, that I, I, it, it's changing in the popular press, um, and I think the problem was with the with the academic the academic elite in in Greece, not in the popular press. For example, you know, I have a publisher in Greece. His family comes from Asia Minor, and they published my book in Greek and it's a bestseller in Greece and all of that. And he was very excited about publishing this book. And I, so I sort of follow their website a little bit and I see that they publish their novels now coming out. I blurbed a couple of them uh, about what happened at Smyrna and so forth. So I think that there's popular appeal and popular taste. And I, I think the, the is sort of the the, the popular end of the pu publishing industry is responding to the vacuum that Ismini is describing. It's the academic elite at you know the University of Athens and 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 I can't believe what a closed world that is. I mean, as an American, I go there and it's it just sort of it's mind-boggling to me um, how academia functions in the nation of Greece. It's like a nightmare, um, and. <clears throat> And, and it's, it's that sort of, um, there's a kind of Europe envy in, in the academic elite in Greece that I think is sort of ashamed of some of Greek history and keeps it out. And, and not and, so- and I'm not an expert in this, but these are intuitions that I pick up from speaking to academics in Greece. The, the official Greek state, a, a, cer a certain Political, uh, you know, uh, regimes. Uh, not uh, that much um, um, ago, a few years ago, the official textbook for public schools. It was that Smyrna was just some kind of a little bit of pushing. That was the official okay. text. Uh, is many, uh, I'm sure that you remember that. Uh, oh they, my goodness, Sinostismos. Indeed, yes. I remember very uh, well. So it's not only only That's the. What I'm talking about. It is the official government policies in, in the Department of Education and Religion. They so. do not know their history. No, no. Oh, they, 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 oh, they don't want to know their history. Maybe. Uh, yeah, right. And Anthony, I, I Anthony I think, uh, if you I, can, I I unmute yourself. It is a shame. 
You know, I think yes. Greece, is an, Greece is an honor country. It's an honor culture to some extent. And I think there's, there's some shame here associated with Smyrna. Yeah, there, there is. But Smyrna, as never, you said, never, never was gr- one of the greatest cities that ever, that ever existed. Anthony, if you can, uh, yeah. say what you're going to say, but also answer this question. You're, you're, you know, tell us a little bit about the play, your thought process in New York, you know, off Broadway, etc. But, but Zmidna was was uh, Turkish at that point already. They were just wanted to get rid of the Greeks, and pay, maybe that's where the the conflict comes. But the play starts off with with uh, the inner musings of my mind, as it were, Anassis's mind, um, and it's what if. What would Anassis say today? I don't know if anybody saw the Times, the London Times this weekend. Um, I did an interview for them. And they. they uh, what would Anassis say if he was here today? If he was using me as a vessel to say, to respond to accusations leveled at him and how he made his first million and, and beyond. And... Uh, I think the play tracks um, everything, everything that you guys have actually spoken about. I hope Dick Ryan agrees with me. And uh, and I go beyond that, where um, after having achieved everything that I want, uh, I go past it. I go past it. And I die alone, on my own, with a pencil, a pad, and a clock next to me. You know, and it's uh, it's like... I ask you, what is it that, you know, you know, perhaps I thought I was Odysseus. You know, perhaps I thought I was Odysseus. Perhaps all I ever wanted was to find a home, my Ithaca, to rebuild my Smyrna. And, and like, you know, so that's what I set up. I also set up the, 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 uh, re- the God, God and the gods and the mistrust that happened because, you know, my fa- my grandmother, who raised me, essentially, he only spoke Turkish. Her Bible was in Turkish. And my uncle, Alexandros, who was a free spirit, you know, and um, and, and and taught me about the, 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 the mythology of uh, of us, of our, our heritage, our mythology. So I juxtaposed those two ideas in the play as well. And, uh, he, he, w- he was, in a sense, even though Zorba was, uh, was uh, you know, didn't have his money or what have you, but he was sort of like, I guess, a Zorba type character to a certain degree. And, uh, you know, many times when you think of the of the Zorba type type character, you think of, of Dionysus and the crucified, you know what I'm saying, combining into, into each other. Did you find him a similar character to a certain degree, a Dionysus? Uh, mm-hmm. You know, and at the same time, you know, part of the Orthodox, uh, you know, you know, whatever. What's your thought on that? Yeah, well, yeah, yes, obviously. I mean, you know, uh, love- I mean, he was he was a Dionysus. Look, look at look at how he look at how he he schemed his way with uh, with Claudia and, uh, you know, with bouquets of flowers and all the rest of that. You know, she was a diva. She was one of the most famous opera singers in the world, Italian into Argentina. For a week, I sent her flowers with a little note to her dressing room at the end of the week. I show up at the stage door. So the, even that is all in it. That is all in it. And you he, know, he was a mar- he was a marketeer. There's no doubt about it. I mean, here he got he he he, he was with Claudia. He went to the the finest, uh, as you said, the finest places, restaurants, etc. The first money that he got, he bought the finest suits. He went to New York, bought the finest suits or whatever. Wanted to go to the best places, even though he had no money, just to make those linkages was eavesdropping on all types of phone conversations to figure out, you know, yeah. you know what to do. He was, he was, uh, yeah, he was Odysseus, cunning, yeah. the Bonneria. I was looking for my Ithaca, you know, I wanted to rebuild my Smyrna. And, and to the point of when the house was annexed by the Turks, um, yeah, he was said, look, I know the house. I know the house. There's a problem with the boiler. You won't have a problem if, if I'm here. I know how to fix it. And indeed, dare I say it, he was could have been um, perhaps had a couple of relationships with uh, uh, one with the young Turkish officer that was living in the house. 
and uh, one with uh, somebody else, which I really don't touch upon. But as I say, you know, he was called a violent man. And I say, I'm, you know, passionate relationships. I'm Greek. We invented passion. Culture. Culture is what makes. Me I mean, he, he did all types of crazy things. He had his boat. And 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 he was he was uh, you know when he would bring people and show the boat he would he would he would mention the, the chairs I think uh, around uh, the oh, bar. No, you're gonna ruin it. You're gonna ruin it. Stop, Lou. Stop. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm rem listen, I'm remembering all these crazy things about him. By the way, it's nothing about that I read recently. It's been, you know, he is he is larger than life. He's like an amazing character. Awesome. With that. With that, we're going to we're going to just get some final comments and and we'll wrap it up. Lou, do you want to start with some final comments or thoughts? Well, I, I think what you're doing is here is terrific, and you know this being the hundredth anniversary, I I would encourage more uh, Greek organizations and 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 Greek Americans to to learn about the history, the modern history of Greece, and to dig into the the, the heritage and the roots of Asia Minor. I think it it's a good thing. I salute you for doing this. Thank you so much, Lou. Uh, Ismini? Well, I certainly echo that. I think it's very important. It's very important to make people aware what happened, why it happened, and, and what it means uh, for what came afterwards. Uh, it's, it's very important to have that. And indeed, I did want to say uh, that uh, there are quite a few revelations about what happened to Smyrna in my book and afterwards, uh, including about the cover-up you mentioned when you introduced me. So more things coming. Well, you know, Ismini, uh, I've been talking with you about the book for the last few years and uh, encouraging you to come out this year <laughs> this year on the on the hundredth anniversary of the of the burning of the uh, of the city it would be it would be really great to help promote the book once it comes out. Nico, your 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 uh, thoughts on uh, on anything really around the topic. Nico, did we lose you? I am I'm very happy to see that uh, uh, art in the form of of uh, of a play uh, can produce. Uh, so many other uh, great directions to go back to history, to reevaluate our relationship with with family members, with with uh, with, with, with community, uh, with uh, with uh, uh, you know uh, people who immigrate, who had trauma. So, as also besides being a sociologist, you said uh, you know the poetry part, the part the part of uh, the literature and art, uh, it's. I'm glad that finally can play again a serious role into our lives, and especially coming out of uh, you know from, from this disaster of the pandemic. You know, uh, it was one of the most tragic things was the closed theaters, mm. the, the, the inability to to go to the theater, right? So, and and the way and the way artists were treated by 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 governmental policies. So I am glad that again, theater in particular, you know, uh, can, 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 can play a significant role into our life and, and give us this opportunity to meet together. Uh, thank you very much for doing this. C certainly, and thank you, Nico. Anthony, if you can, just uh, expand a little bit about, about the play, where, where it's at, what's happening, what your thought process is. I think just uh, echoing what Nico said, I think it's fantastic quite frankly, that, that, you had, that you had the gumption to come out and open a play off Broadway, you know, on, on again, on the heels of, of, uh, of COVID and all the rest of that. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a great, tremendous thing. And in particular, to discuss someone that, that is, is just, as I said, bigger than life, quite frankly, and someone that, that has done a lot of negative, a lot of positive, but someone who we, we should admire to a certain degree, even though a lot of people hate him, but we should admire him to a certain degree. Tell us a little bit more about the play, the theater, anything you want around the play. Thank you. Sure, sure. And, and, and as a good gospel of myself, uh, being a separate, uh, uh, I, I, there is an affinity to this, to that aspect of his life. It's a wonderful theatre. It's a George can speak more. Zuber can speak more to the theatre. It's uh, it's been there for years. The guy that runs it is very passionate. We were looking for the theatre before lockdown, just before lockdown happened. 
friend and myself, and um, seen a couple, and then we walked into that theatre. I opened the door, yay much, this much. And we just looked at each other. We didn't even see each side. We just smelled the place. And we knew that was the place. And we opened the door, and it's just, for us, compared to what is on Broadway, it's, 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 a, it's a fantastic space. Uh, uh, regarding my thought process, the process of the play, um, I'm just a vessel. Trust me. Uh, I remember uh, he the, what if he didn't want what was in there to be in there, it couldn't be in there. Tell us about the fourth. What what's happening on March the fourth? Oh, uh, I hate to say just the fourth, but the play opens on the third and it runs through to the twentieth. Uh, we're we're uh, doing uh, our preview. We're going to it's tomorrow. We're lighting it. Technical rehearsals Monday, Tuesday. Wednesday, we do a dress rehearsal, um, and Thursday, we do our first preview. The fourth is when we uh, open up to the press. And uh, if we performed it in Athens, Nigos, about uh, with Athenae Gafeata, the Onisis Paneo Dagis. And uh, I think that is more scary than now, putting up a Greek in front of the Greeks. Um, and there were Uber titles above me, and that was difficult to try and connect with the audience. But it's odd because, yes, Lou, you're absolutely right. A lot of people do despise him, don't speak well of him. Um, but in Greece, people love him. You'll find that odd one person now go, eh, he was a whale killer. He killed whales. He did this. He did that. You know, well, how else is he going to get the leather for that stool? I, 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 did, I didn't bring it up for that purpose. I didn't bring it up for that purpose. Uh, Lou, you, you, you had uh, you had a comment, Lou? Well, I just uh, it's four o'clock and I've got another commitment. So okay. I just want to say thank you very much for including me. I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, you know, you. And uh We'll continue the conversation through the year. So great to thank see you, Lou. Thank, thank you so much, Lou. I, thank I, you I'm for being with us. In New York to see the play. I can't wait. Ex thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Bye bye. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dick Grant. Uh, comments uh, with regards yeah, just, to uh, yeah. just one thought. When, when we played in Atlanta, we played at a, a house that you know was doing badly, like every other house is right now, because of the pandemic. And um, and you know he's a he's thankfully a controversial character, and um, I you know I've worked in a lot of different theaters and a lot of different cultures. I worked a lot in Scotland, and um, I've worked in what is now Croatia and you know Bosnia Herzegovina. I've actually played at Athens, the Herod Atticus in Hamlet, um, and one of the things that strikes me that does happen in Europe is that you cross the bridge from the Glasgow sits to go to the pub. And there's some guy standing at the bar who turns on you and says, so what was Sean O'Casey saying? What exactly was he saying? And then he shouts across the bar that Celtic won today 3-5. You know, there's a kind of vigor about controversial material. And there's a, the, you know, this is the great Greek legacy from the ancients, that it's about discussion and argument. And that's a brilliant thing that this play is all about. So I just, that's my thing. Thank you so uh, much. Our job George. is to hold up a mirror to society, I yeah. believe. Uh, uh, George Zuvalos, some, uh, some final comments, words? Yeah, real quick. Very much so, Onassis was this modern day Hellenic, P.T. Barnum-esque, business tycoon. And I think to be able to capture the essence of that character in his theater with Anthony Scordy and Dick Rand, where you have the ceilings at the American Theater of Actors made by the same guy who designed Grant's tomb in horse hair and plaster is going to be so compelling, just the smell of an old theater, not a rotten smell, but it smells like a theater. And I'm looking forward to seeing everybody come down on any date they're available to come visit us. Well, there's, there's no doubt that I think, uh, you know, Anthony, uh, Dick Rand and yourself have, have done something that, that's, that's fantastic for, for New York, not only, not only to the Hellenic people, but obviously all New Yorkers, because 
we're all waiting for something fresh, something different. And uh, there's almost no greater character in the 20th century that, that is more fascinating than, than, than Onassis himself. And, and Anthony you, and, and everyone associated with this play should be congratulated to, to bringing this to New York on an off-Broadway basis. We hope it's a tremendous success and uh, we hope it, it goes to Broadway. I, I know, uh, Anthony, you, you, uh, you mentioned, you know, the great response it got when it was played in Athens. Uh, I heard a lot also about uh, when it played in the U.S. and and even even in Atlanta, where it was uh, tremendously received from what I've gathered by by the community. So uh, we're all for it. We we want uh, it to be a success here in New York. We do want it to go to Broadway. And uh, just for the audience, again, the play will open on March the third and runs through the twentieth at the American Theater of Actors which is on uh, 314 West 54th Street in Manhattan. Uh, uh, George, do you want to tell us where to get uh, tickets? How do you get tickets? You can go on Eventbrite, um, put in the words Onassis or put in the words Scordi, S-K-O-R-D-I. It will navigate you to both the March 3rd through the 20th, plus the benefit on March 15th uh, that's going to be benefiting uh, the Greek section of the Ronald McDonald House and uh, the Queens College Hellenic Initiatives. Uh, so it's Eventbrite, look it up, put in Onassis. If you don't know how to spell that, you can spell Scordi, S-K-O-R-D-I, and it will navigate you to the right show. Is, is Mini, uh, Nico, Anthony, uh, Dick Rand, George, thank you for being uh, with us today. Lou had to leave us a few minutes ago, but thank you all, you were great panelists. I encourage everyone to go see uh, to see this play. And again, for those who want to find out about our future uh, events, uh, panel discussions, just go on the internet, embca.com. For uh, recording of this particular uh, panel discussion and others, you can go on YouTube under EMBCA. And uh, thank you all for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Lou. Thank say, you, Zmini. I want to give a big thank yeah, you. Yeah, please, Anthony. A big thank you to you, who was like very instrumental in making this thing possible. And I, I you know, I'll, I'll forever be indebted and grateful to you. So thank you, both I and Dick. I'm, I'm, I'm indebted and and thank you for allowing me to to support this particular endeavor that you're having because I think I think it's fantastic. And congratulations to you and the whole team. Thank you again, guys. Thank, thank you, you. Lucas.